I read John's account of the conversation between Jesus and Pilate several months ago with the high school Sunday school class in my congregation. We read all the way into chapter 19, and there's even more back and forth in that chapter, with Pilate moving inside the palace to speak with Jesus, and then outside to address the religious leaders and the crowds, and then back inside to talk with Jesus again. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke's accounts of Christ's trial, Pilate questions Jesus only briefly. Are you the king? That's what you say. But if you read around today's lectionary passage, you'll see John gives us a good bit of dialogue. The youth who read it with me thought, Pilate seems to be wrestling with who Jesus is and what's happening here. And Jesus gives Pilate room to wrestle. At a faith-rooted organizing training I took part in last winter, we read this story as one of three stories about ways people of faith have ministered to people in power. The first story we read was from 2 Samuel, where the prophet Nathan confronted King David after David had raped Bathsheba and murdered her husband Uriah. Nathan knew King David well and was able to speak to David in a way that penetrated the moral fog that had descended on David. Nathan basically tricked David into seeing the injustice he'd done. We also read about Mordecai appealing to his cousin, Queen Esther, challenging her to see how the king's plan to destroy the Jews posed a risk, not just to other people, but to Queen Esther herself. Mordecai challenged Esther to see how God wanted her to use her power to help, that if she didn't help, she'd have to live with that, that if she did help, whole communities of people would be praying for her and for God to support her. Finally, we read this story about Jesus and Pilate, this story in which Jesus makes visible what is invisible, a heavenly kingdom a holy truth. And Jesus invites Pilate to think seriously about that kingdom and that truth. Christ even invites Pilate to receive it. It was a big deal for Jesus to do this with Pilate. Sort of like last year I was talking about community organizing with a group of pastors and one of them asked, if we could get a meeting with President Trump, who'd want to go? What would you say? No matter what you think of our president, to meet with him would be a big deal. Jesus had never met with Pilate before, but had surely heard about him. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor in Judea, had a reputation for being arrogant, for bullying, and for acting in ways that were offensive. Even apart from what was known about Pilate personally, Consider all that the Roman governor represented. 63 years before Jesus was born, Rome had conquered and colonized Palestine and began to make life miserable for the people who lived there. The trauma was deep and fresh when Jesus was born because right around that time, there was an insurrection against the Roman Empire. The Romans crucified 2,000 Jews as punishment. 2,000 people killed in one day. The streets were red with blood. When Jesus was young, the road between Sephorus and his hometown of Nazareth was literally lined with the crosses of crucified men as a warning against any future rebellion. The African-American theologian and civil rights leader Howard Thurman wrote about how, when Jesus was a youth in Palestine, the most urgent question of his community, the Jewish community, was what must be the attitude toward Rome? How could the Jewish people preserve their self-esteem and also respond to Rome in a morally tolerable way? Because Rome was the enemy. Rome symbolized total frustration. Rome was the great barrier to peace of mind. And Rome was everywhere. 
No Jewish person of the period could deal with the question of their practical life, their vocation, their place in society, until first they had determined their attitude toward the Romans, who controlled every aspect of their lives. Thurman notes that most often, Jews responded to Rome with some mixture of fear and hatred, and by trying to evade or deceive their oppressors wherever they could. But Jesus practiced something different. He practiced sincerity instead of deception. He practiced trust instead of fear. He practiced love instead of hatred, even love of his enemy, Rome. Jesus practiced love of his enemy. Howard Thurman wrote about love of the enemy, and he unpacked it a bit, dividing the enemy into three categories. First, there's the personal enemy, someone you know who's hurt you. Second, there are people who are part of your community who, because of what they're doing, make it difficult for your community to live freely and without shame. As an example of this kind of enemy, Thurman suggests the tax collectors of Jesus' day. They were Israelites, so they were part of the Jewish family, but they collaborated with Rome to oppress their own people. That betrayal was particularly hard to forgive. But the third category of enemy was the most complex and the most difficult to engage. It was exemplified by Rome. When Jews encountered any Roman person, they encountered not only that individual, but Rome itself, a political and religious enemy that was known to be arrogant and powerful and oppressive. Long before he met Pontius Pilate, Jesus had demonstrated a surprising and even, as his friends might say, an appalling openness to the people of Rome. One day, a Roman captain came to Jesus seeking help for his servant, for whom he had a profound attachment, who was sick and dying. This Roman captain had tried everything to help his servant, and nothing had worked. So this Roman citizen sought help from Jesus, a Jewish teacher. The man placed his need before Jesus, and Jesus helped him. In his encounter with Pontius Pilate, I think Jesus demonstrates a similar openness, a willingness to meet Pilate where he was, and also to open a door for Pilate into something more than he was. Christ's willingness to do that was outrageous and offensive to many of his peers. Throughout the Gospels, it's where we see the Jewish community turning on Jesus, where he dare, when he dares to suggest that God's blessings will extend outside their community to people who are not only foreigners, but also enemies. It infuriated Jesus' community because they were an oppressed people. As Lisa Sharon Harper says, oppressed people don't dream of their oppressors being set free. Barabbas was ready to fight the oppressor. Everyone understood that. But Jesus? Jesus was willing to look the enemy in the eye, open a door, and invite his enemy through, even to the kingdom of God. That is so much harder to stomach or understand. In our faith-rooted organizing training, after we read the story about Jesus and Pilate, Lisa Sharon Harper led us in a conversation about how we might think about doing what Jesus did, making room for someone else to see differently. Lisa drew a spiral shape and suggested that all of us, in the course of our lives, travel a path that is less like a straight line than a spiral. We keep coming back to questions about our lives and vocations and place in the world. They aren't really new questions, but our experiences cause us to hear them and answer them in different ways. Consider something you've evolved in your thinking about, or even changed your mind about. Maybe it's something relatively simple, like whether you're a cat person or a dog person. Maybe it's something more complex, 
like your opinion about a foreign country and what the people from that place might be like. Maybe it's something related to your faith or the stories of scripture. A paradigm shift occurs when you change your mind in a fundamental way. Your assumptions about something shift significantly. Probably you've had an experience that raised questions for you, and then another experience that raised even different questions. And that series of new experiences led to a new way of seeing the world. We all go through shifts like that. It's part of living and growing. As people of faith, we're taught and encouraged to believe that God navigates those shifts and walks those paths with us. God somehow holds the paths we walk. What's more, you and I can work with God to help one another along those spiraling paths of seeing one way and then having experienced something new, seeing another way. Jesus shows us how we may be called to do this with unlikely people, with powerful people, with people who've done us all kinds of harm. Thinking again about Howard Thurman, an African-American man in the civil rights era, he understood much better than I do the challenges of helping an enemy see anew. We are called to help each other along and to be helped along into new ways of seeing. We talk about today's story, this encounter between Jesus and Pilate as the trial of Jesus, but it's also the trial of Pilate. Will he see something new? Will he act any differently as a result? In the Gospel according to John, judgment is not something God inflicts on us, like a punishment, so much as it is what happens when we fail to recognize God's gifts to the world in Jesus Christ. God comes to people with love and truth and an open door. People experience judgment when we reject God. We choose fear instead of trust, deception instead of truth, hatred instead of love. We close the door and shut ourselves off from God. That choice has consequences for us and consequences beyond us. In this story, at this pivotal moment we are hearing about, Pontius Pilate will close the door on Jesus Christ. Pilate's story, all that back and forth, is part of a larger story of God's love coming in a way that was and is too shocking for most of us. We are inclined, as Pilate was, to turn from Jesus and all he asks of us. Yet beyond all the stories of offense and rejection, there is, we're told, still another story, another dimension in that spiral of time. It's the story of light shining in the darkness. Light shining and shining and showing that nothing, not even all the powers of the empire, can snuff it out.